A hundred years ago, a new threat to civilization quickly spread through homes around the world. This insidious activity was bemoaned as the thing that would destroy a society that had already weathered a world war and the deadliest plague in centuries. The threat? Crosswords. Because what's more dangerous than a grid of words that goes both up and across? Ugh. Hi, I'm Dylan and this is Not Exactly Normal. Apparently I love talking about moral panics because this is my fifth time up a bat on this channel. And if you look at my big episode idea list, you'll see the phrase moral panic comes up at least 15 times. It's a bit much. There have been moral panics basically since forever, but they've increased in prevalence as we've come up with more ways to amplify the voices of the few and present them as the many. Good evening. Tonight we begin with a story about make-believe adventure and real life violence. And what some critics fear is a connection between the two in a game called Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons, video games, Superman, pinball, bicycles, the post office, and many more have all inspired panic and in at least enough people to publish their personal feelings as societal ones. Now let's discuss whether there is any link between violence on the screen and real violence with Ben Shapiro. Yet one of my favorite moral panics was over one of my dad's favorite things to do, other than going to Tim Hortons for a craveable roast beef sandwich, hashtag not sponsored, crosswords. In the 1920s, they thought crosswords would lead to a collapse in society. Why? That's a good question. The first crossword puzzle, then called a word cross, was printed in New York World in December of 1913. Created by Arthur Wynne, a British journalist, the puzzle was shaped like a diamond and had no black squares, and was loosely based off a few different word games that he played back in England. To everyone's surprise, this puzzle that was meant to be filler took off, and soon the newspaper was receiving thousands of reader-submitted crosswords. So much so that in 1915, Wynne commented, quote, the puzzle editor has kindly figured out that the present supply will last until the second week in December 2100. Soon the idea spread to other newspapers and it, now renamed Crosswords, had officially entered thing status. And I'm not talking about a guy made of rocks. Or am I? No. Crosswords quickly spread from America to Canada and the UK, soon finding an audience in the royal family, with Queen Mary partaking of the popular puzzles. Princess Melita Victoria also got into crosswords on her 1925 trip to America. By March of 1925, crosswords had made their way to France and Japan. The crossword craze grew big enough that in 1925, it inspired a Broadway show with Elsie Janis called Puzzles of 1925, as well as a comedy film called Puzzled by Crosswords with Pete Gordon. The costumes were pretty sweet. The craze also inspired a novelty song called Crossword Mama You Puzzle Me, which is a pretty good time if you ask me. you like the crossword craze, crossword mama you puzzle me, the papa's gonna figure you out. You call me honey and ask me to speak, looks like I'll be stung no doubt. Along with this surge in popularity came a wave of animated films. There was the adventures of Pongo the Pup, Pongo Catches the Crossword Craze in 1923, Felix All Puzzled in 1924, and Alice Solves the Puzzle in 1925, which was created by Walt Disney. I bet you it's not in the public domain. Crosswords also inspired the fashion industry, with a crossword sweater spotted in Leeds and crossword stocking spotted here in Toronto in 1925. And to top off the greys, mentalist slash daredevil Harry Kahn put on a performance where he solved a giant crossword upside down whilst being dangled outside of an office building in Washington. And as with all new things that people are into, the initial wave of excitement was followed by a larger or at least louder wave of people who were varying degrees of offended. By crosswords. For reasons. Most of the crossword eight reads like an old man yelling at a cloud, and one of the most common complaints is that they were time wasters, and they would bring the world to a halt. In 1925, the Sunday Mirror was so certain that crosswords were, quote, holding up our national activities, that they published a cartoon showing how they had stopped up politics, housing, sales, chess games, and that they were also responsible for breaking young women's hearts. Gladys, I came around specially to ask you something tonight. Oh, Reginald. I have no idea what it is. Do you know a word of 18 letters meaning an Australian waterfowl? Oh, 
One reporter in the Aberdeen Press and Journal wrote in 1924, quote, Indeed, it is gravely affirmed that more time is lost at the crossword game than through strikes or lockouts. Of course, without actually having any data to back that claim up. According to critics, the crossword craze had infected all areas of life. In the Nottingham Evening Post, they reported witnessing a woman in a grocery store asking a clerk what brands of flour they sold. And after he had told her, he found out that she wasn't actually shopping for flour, but for an answer for her crossword. The nerve. Hey, that's the headline. Theater owners were also complaining that people weren't going out anymore, preferring to stay home and do their crosswords. But it wasn't just the audiences. On one occasion, Canadian stage actor Matheson Lang missed his entrance in a production of The Wandering Jew due to being obsessed with a crossword. Not even the zoo was free from the crossword craze, with reports in the Nottingham Evening Post of zookeepers being bogged down with requests from crazed crossworders like, quote, what is a female kangaroo or a fragile feature in six letters ending in T-O? There were also several instances of people proposing via crossword, though there weren't too many reports of people accepting those proposals. I wonder why. Though there were articles detailing crosswords ending engagements. What's a seven letter word for I'm sleeping with your sister? Soon, crossword contests started to pop up, and they made the game infinitely more popular. You had to pay to enter, and the grand prize was several thousand of whatever the local currency was. Dollars here. The contests were run through the post office, and a lot of them weren't ready for the mass influx in mail that came with. One reporter for the Northampton Chronicle wrote that the crossword craze is holding up public services, with mail being delayed and postal workers being overburdened with heavy bags. With the massive amount of new mail, the post office in England had to set up a new special contest division in order to handle it all. These crossword contests got contentious, and at least one crossword maker was brought before the court. In this case, a crossword maker was charged by the police for giving ambiguous clues that could be answered with different words, leaving it up to chance as to who the winner would be. They gave the words love or dove as the answer to a term of endearment, with the prosecution citing a quote from poet Alfred Tennyson, he is coming, my dove, my dear, in order to prove their claim. It didn't work. This contest-fueled boom in crosswords had a big impact on libraries and bookstores, which is where a lot of the criticisms came from. Dictionaries were so popular that they sold out almost immediately, leaving crossworders to turn to the black market. For crosswords. Here in Toronto, one man pleaded guilty to stealing dictionaries from bookstores and selling them back to secondhand stores and to people at Union Station. He was sentenced to three months on the farm. Libraries were quickly overwhelmed by crossworders looking for dictionaries, and soon several libraries had to keep their dictionaries, encyclopedias, and thesauruses under guard. Or is it thesaurusi? Due to the extreme shortage of dictionaries, the New York Public Library stated that they would only lend out each of its 150 dictionaries to people using them for, quote, legitimate reference purposes, and not for crosswords. Many libraries were not super happy about this surge in crossword traffic. In Leamington Spa, they ran with the headline, quote, crossword puzzle craze, newspapers mutilated a public library. I feel like Leslie Nope wrote that, except in an alternate timeline where she likes the library. They go on to say, quote, that acts of willful mutilation had been committed on newspapers and periodicals in the reading rooms, and that the crossword puzzle craze was the cause. So what does willful mutilation of a newspaper look like? Well, they filled in the crosswords. The chairman of the library then threatened crossworders with legal prosecution should this behavior continue. The behavior again, just so we're clear, was doing crosswords. Other libraries dealt with this by coloring in the crosswords with pencil in order to prevent people from mutilating them. Similarly, in the Westminster Gazette, they wrote that dirty crossworders are doing irreparable damage to dictionaries, valued at 60 pounds by, quote, wetting their fingers in order to turn pages. I didn't like reading that. The other big complaint about crossworders is that they were just rather annoying, especially at the crossword parties, which were a thing, where people would get together with other people and do crosswords while drinking alcohol and smoking cigarettes, and maybe doing drugs, and getting into all other types of things, like Sudoku. A reporter for the Daily Mirror describes, quote, entering a room where a party was gathered for dinner. I was at once saluted by a storm of questions like these. Can you give us the name of a four-footed animal in six letters of which the last must be S? It's not horse. Zebras. Z-E-B-R-A-S. I would be great at crosswords in 1924. A journalist for the Worthington Herald describes crossworders as a, quote, pestiferous nuisance to all with whom they come in contact. In this article, by the way, he was describing his nephew, who was asking him for help with a crossword. 
But my favorite article overreacting about the crossword craze comes from the Tamworth Herald. It starts out super level-headed with, quote, crossword puzzles, an enslaved America. Off to a great start. Then the author goes on to describe the crossword craze as a, quote, menace because it is making devastating inroads on the working hours of every rank of society. Bishops in their studies and judges on the bench are no more immune from it than typists and errand boys. Everywhere, at any hour of the day, people can be seen quite shamelessly poring over their checkerboard diagrams, cudgeling their brains for four-letter words meaning molten rock or a six-letter word meaning idler or whatnot. In trains and trams or omnibuses, in subways, in private offices and counting rooms, in factories and homes, and even, though as yet rarely, with hymnals for camouflage in church. Crossword puzzles have dealt the final blow to the art of conversation, and they have been known to break up homes. Twice within the past week or so, there have been reports of police magistrates sternly rationing addicts to three puzzles a day, with an alternative of 10 days in the workhouse, because wives have been complaining that their misguided spouses have been neglecting the support of their families. They go on to say, quote, it is estimated that not less than 10 million people have caught the infection, and that they spend half an hour daily on the average with the insidious pastime. That is to say that 5 million hours daily of the American people's time, most of nominally working hours, are being used up in unprofitable trifling. It is indeed no longer a joke, this lost productive activity of far more time than is lost by labor strikes. Wait until he hears about TikTok. Ravings of a man out of touch aside, not all the reporting was negative. Multiple libraries reported increases in traffic from crossworders leading to books being signed out that hadn't been touched in years. The Toronto Star wrote in 1925 that at least, quote, the crossword puzzle is an infinitely more useful craze than most of its many predecessors, noting that some teachers were using crosswords to teach Latin. In a tragic case, and one that's very demonstrative of the fixation the media had on the so-called craze, as well as reminiscent of how the media still covers moral panics, in Brooklyn in December of 1925, a man was reported to have killed his wife and attempted suicide because his wife declined to help him solve a crossword. In most of the articles that I read, the journalists would make quips about how crosswords were just a fad, and that in a few years they would be taken over by the next thing. Yet, year after year, crosswords persisted, as did people writing articles about crosswords persisting, and as we all know today, the crazed infatuation with the puzzles faded away as they took on the role of commonplace at breakfast tables around the world, possibly only to be supplanted in my dad's heart by Sudoku. Yet, while I find all of this crossword drama, both the criticism and the infatuation, pretty absurd, I guess I shouldn't be too surprised given how certain people reacted when they banned a few words on Wordle. Wordle has gone woke. And the popular word game Wordle is going woke. Uh, they've made it woke. You can't guess words like slave or lynch. They removed the word fetus to avoid triggering anybody over the Roe versus Wade abortion debate. I've got my own wordle for that. Crazy. The more things change, the more they stay the same. As a side note, all of these crosswords still exist, so if you're looking for an old-timey challenge, try a crossword from 1924 and get a taste for the craze. So what should I talk about next? Please let me know in the comments, and be sure to subscribe for new episodes as often as I can make them. Hopefully more frequently than the last two years. Thanks for watching. Crosswords, baby. This is the stupidest audio setup, by the way. Was we'll follow goats here these days? Chicken, probably. It was in France. What do they drink there? Wine. And drinking wine. Red, maybe. Or white. Then if you spill it, it's not as big of a deal. I saw a guy smoking a pipe the other day. Corn cob pipe, downtown Toronto. It's real fed up. I was sucking on it. What's that for? I've never smoked a pipe. Why'd you have, why'd they have to do that sound? What's that for? Pipe smokers, let me know in the comments. Also, what's better, corn cob or the Sherlock Holmes? You decide. Comments.